Students, welcome to lesson 80. This is kind of a fun little throwback to something that we've done in the past, and I'm excited to show it to you. Um, notice the way I wrote the lesson title here. We're going to talk about direct variation, and we're talking about inverse variation. And remember, inverse is just another way of saying indirect. They're kind of opposites of each other. We've talked about those before. This time we're going to talk about them as ratios. Uh, one of the really thing, cool things that I think John Saxon does is he's trying to set you up so that when you encounter math in your science classes, and we've talked about this, you will immediately feel familiar with the calculation end of it, and that frees your mind to focus on the science part of it. So, some scientists run these calculations in different formats. Um, in direct and inverse variation are very common in science classes, and so he's going to show you another way to do these calculations. We've already talked about one way, and I'll remind you of what that is, but he's showing you a second way that will give you the very same answer, but depending on the science teacher you have, they may use one style or the other. So what John is very cleverly doing is he's setting you up so that no matter which way your teacher approaches the calculation, you'll go, oh, right, I remember doing this. So he's a cool guy. Once again, my hero is John Saxon. Um, Part A, we're going to talk about the direct variation side of it. And we've done these before. We've talked about things like, um, oh gosh, when the number of boys in the classroom goes up, the number of girls in the classroom also goes up. When the number of children in the room goes up, the number of toys on the floor also goes up. So we've talked about um, cause and effect where an increase in one will increase will lead to an increase in the other. And that's what we call direct variation, because they're most, both moving in the same direction. As the number of kids in the room falls, the number of mothers in the room falls. So um, it can go up or down, but direct means that both, uh, both scenarios are moving in the same direction. Both variables are moving in the same direction. We have used... Oops, that's an X. We have used a formula that looks something like this to describe it, where X is one element, Y is the other element, and K is a constant that links the two. Okay, and we've done calculations with this. Oh, I don't even know when it was. It was quite a while back. I think it was around Christmas time when we started talking about these. Some science teachers will use this format for setting up their uh, variation problems. And I would even change this just so that it matches to the way John is talking about the variables in this lesson. This is another way of saying this very same thing. A is one variable, B is the other variable, K is the constant that links them. Um, every child gets three pieces of candy, so for every child there is, the constant would be three, so that you would have three pieces of candy for each kid. That's basically how it works. There's another way to do these problems, which is to say the variable before the change over the same variable after the change will be in proportion to the second variable before the change and the second variable after the change. These two approaches will get you the very same answer. We've already practiced this, so now we're going to practice this style. Again, One's not better than the other. We're just prepping you for whatever science teacher you might have. Okay, so here, let's look at example 80.2. And I am on page 332. These, uh, these equations, these formulas, and an explanation of what I just was talking about is on page 331, so you can go back and find that. But here's our problem. Cost varies directly as the number purchased. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Cost, I'm just going to write this down, varies directly with number purchased. The more you buy, the more the cost goes up. We can relate, right? If 12 can be purchased, For $78, how much would 42 cost? Okay, we could easily 
use this, work this problem using this old strategy. We're going to try it the other way. Um, in the book, they show you both strategies so that you can compare. But I'm just going to focus on showing you. They, they give these letters. They call this one A and they call this one B. In the book, they go ahead and work that out. And if you want to refresh your memory, go ahead and look on page 332, because that's where our example is, and you'll see them working out that problem. I want to focus on using this new technique so that you get a chance to see how that works. The and notice that it really doesn't, the one question students have is, okay, is cost supposed to be A or B? Which one's the cost and which one's the numbers purchased? Here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't really matter because as you note, as long as you put the first one over the second one and the other first one over the other second one, it doesn't matter which side you call cost and which side you call purchase, number purchase. So that's a really nifty thing about this is it's really hard to screw it up, to be honest. That's how I think about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to call one variable C for cost, and I'm going to use the other one, I'm going to use N for number purchased, okay? So I'm going to be, say the first cost over the second cost is going to be equal to the first number over the second number. Now it's just a simple matter of plugging in. 12 can be purchased for 78, so this is my first cost. 78 is my first cost. 12 is my first number purchased, and they're asking me how much would it cost, so there's my X, for 42, that's my second number. There's the problem right there. We're not going to worry about creating that constant, we just know that the relationships between these numbers are going to hold, so we set it up as a ratio. And let me just remind you, first cost over second cost, first number over second number. Doesn't matter which we put on the right and which we put on the left as long as we match the costs and we match the numbers. Now to solve this is a simple matter of cross multiplying. So we know that 78 times 42 is going to equal 12x and we're going to divide both sides by 12 so that we get Cancel that out. Okay, so now we've got our x isolated. Now let's see what we can do to simplify this a little bit. I'm just trying to think of a quick way. I know that this is 6 times 7. I'm going to do a little bit of prime factoring here so that I can do some of this multiplication without the work of using a calculator. 40, I don't want to blow all these numbers up. I want to cancel as much as possible. 42 is 6 times 7. So I'm going to cross that out, and there's my 6 times 7. 12 is 6 times 2. So I'm going to cross out the 12 and write the 6 times 2 instead. Now I can cancel this 6 against this 6. Okay, so I've gotten rid of the 6's, top and bottom. Now I see I've got a 2 left on the bottom, and this is 78, so that's an even number. So that must be what? 35, 39 times 2. Yep, that's right. So now I can cancel the 2's against each other. So now I'm left with one simple calculation. I know that x is equal to 39 times 7. So I'll just quickly go over here. 39 times 7. 9 times 7 is 63. 7 times 3 is 21. Plus 6 more is 27. I peeked ahead in the book and that is definitely the right answer. So 273 is the cost of 42 items. And we found that using this style of direct variation. Cool, huh? I like that. I think that's really fun. To me, it's not a huge big deal to calculate the constants, constants but I find this a much more intuitive and natural kind of flow. It's really easy for me to just plug the variables in. Um, but on the other hand, if this just bugs you, that's fine. This one will give you just as many good answers, but I do ask you to practice this so that a science teacher will not throw you for a loop if they switch gears on you. Um, that's direct variation. Let's talk for a minute about the inverse or indirect variation. I'm going to remind you that in this case, notice that we had the first version of each variable on the top, the second version on the bottom first version on the top, second version on the bottom, because we're going to mix that up in part B. Let me move that paper out of the way. 
In part B, where we talk about inverse variations, I'll remind you that in our previous work with these, we had A and B as being the two related items that were varying, and our constant sat in the numerator of a fraction that had the second scenario in the bottom. Remember our inverse direction, our inverse variations were things like um, the number of food items in the, the number of um, pieces of candy in the Halloween basket went down as the number of trick-or-treaters went up. The number of pieces of pizza in the box went down as the number of dads in the room went up. Um, or let's see, we can make one going the other way. The number of, I don't know, can't think at the moment, but you, you guys can remember how to do these scenarios. Um, these are the ones where we're going in opposite directions. Now look and see what happens when we use our other style of, when we use our ratio format to do these. It's very nifty. This time, we'll have our first A on the top, our second A on the bottom, but look what happens with the Bs. Whoa! See what we did here? First A on the top, second A on the bottom, second B on the top, first B on the bottom. They flip. And that's kind of intuitive to me. That makes a certain amount of sense because we're talking about a reaction, a variation where things are flipping around. So it kind of makes sense that um, we would flip the second fraction here so that it's kind of, it seems sort of upside down to us because these are about upside down reactions. So there's our difference for the inverse variations. Let's look at a problem. I'm looking at example 80.3. I'm on page 332, and it says blues vary inversely as yellows squared. What does that even mean? Well, I think what it means is that we have, a second, inversely, I spelled it wrong, and there's an E right there. I guess we've got like marbles in a bag or something, game pieces, I don't know. Maybe it's the color of flowers in a bouquet, that could be. Um, and it sounds a little complicated because we've got squares in there, but watch, it doesn't really get scary at all. That's one thing I like with this. So, if 100 blues go with two yellows, how many blues go with ten yellows? Let's imagine it's bouquets. That kind of works for me. Go with ten yellows. Okay, so we're it's like a formula for making pretty bouquets and they like to have more blues. So no, I guess it changes. I don't know. These, this is just a weird problem, so I don't know if we can conceptualize it or not. So we can use either one of these strategies. But this time we need to be careful that we square the right variable. So if we were using the first one, we would say the number of blues is linked by a constant to the number of yellows squared. And I just copy that language right into the problem in the way I set up my variables. So that's the old way that we could do it. The new way is to say the beginning number of blues over the second number of blues equals the, I'm going to write both the, notice I'm using, <clears throat> excuse me, yellowed squared again, and we want the first number of yellow squared on the bottom, and we want the second number of yellow squared on the top. Notice that the I've got, lot, I've got a subscripted variable and an exponent. The subscript refers to whether it's before or after, and the exponent is taking into consideration the fact that our yellows are squared. So, a little bit confusing, but again, we just pull the language right into our variables, and it's neat and clean. So now let's figure this out. If 10 blues, that's our starting number of blues, goes with two yellows, so that's our starting number of yellows, and notice we want to square it. Then, 
how many blues, so there's our x, there's the equal sign, go with 10 yellows. And so then there's our 10 squared up top. Make sense? Setting these up is, is the big part of the challenge. Once we get them set, it's not too bad. But there is our new formula, and there is the way we plug the information in. This is the tricky part, is making sure you get the squared in your variable. Um, if you want to see the way they set it up using the old format, um, the book does show that, but I'm just going to focus on the new format. So now we've got our problem set up. It's a simple matter of solving. 10 squared equals 100. 2 squared equals 4. So, 4, now I'm going to cross multiply, 4 times 100, and I'll show you this the long way, equals 100x, whoa, that's not going to be too hard, is it? Divide both sides by 100 to isolate our x, those cancel, x equals 4. So that tells us how many blues we would have associated with the 10 yellows. I'm still trying to think of a scenario as to why you would have those, how you would want those blues and yellows changing like that. I guess it's some sort of chemical reaction. Let's say that. But that's the way we can use these, this formula, this style of formula, to solve the inverse variations. There are not any more examples for you to work, so you can just jump right into the practice problems and start working on your homework. Good luck.